Well, it's great to see you this morning. I'm glad you braved it out on a Saturday morning on a weekend. Come uh, and enjoy open source software at its finest. Uh, the Pi Data Conference Series is a phenomenal worldwide movement. Uh, it's been a real treat to watch you and your colleagues around the world create this conference series. Uh, it was impressive to me with the demand for this effort. When we started the very first one in 2012, we were recognizing the interest in data science and the fact that everybody was using Python but nobody was really talking about it. And so we created this conference series to really bring people together and it just exploded. Uh, it was always based on the principle of community organization. So there is a foundational uh, group at NumFocus that helps uh, support and provide some consistency for these conferences, but they don't happen without your support and without your organizational effort. So whenever I look at on the webpage and I see 14 conferences around the world, um, I don't know what the exact number is this year, but it's something big. Uh, I'm just really impressed by the momentum of all of you. Open source really is a, fa a, a fantastic phenomenon. And I thought I'd talk today a little about my story with open source. And it goes back a ways. I've been doing this for a while and trying to figure out how to make it work with business for a while. And so I thought I'd just share some of my experiences today. It's kind of a little more personal of a talk. Uh, some may have seen parts of this if you watch my Pied New York City talk. Uh, it's, it'll be basically roughly the same with, a full, I'm sure, a few uh, uh, iterations. Um, but it is a little exposing to me, kind of I, I tend to shy away from getting too into the details of things I've experienced and what I've done. Uh, and I'll probably go into some more details here and hopefully some will be useful to you and, you, and uh, help you in your journey to make your life and your uh, earning potential and your ability to contribute to the world consistent with your ability to contribute to open source, which is really the, the goal I've had for 20 years, as I'll explain. Um, this timeline kind of helps you orient uh, to kind of the, the, some of the things we'll be talking about. On the top is kind of my journey. I started in Python and open source in 1998, 1999, 1998, while I was at the Mayo Clinic. I really got started in my career to be a uh, machine, um, what do we call it, a biomedical engineer. Uh, MRI and ultrasound is what I studied. And then kind of through the course of time, I've ended up doing more and more software, still with a passion for scientific discovery and scientific exploration. And I've been happy to realize that actually business is not that different from science in terms of trying to discover what the world needs, or discovering what people want uh, and what we'll pay for. And so there's a lot of uh, similarities uh, to my experiences in science that have shown up in business as well. And below is this explosion of open source ecosystem that's, that's emerged. Many people are surprised to learn that SciPy came out so much earlier than NumPy. But it's because there was an array object that came before. Numeric was actually already available when I came to Python. And that's the reason I came to Python, was because of the work that people had done to create Numeric. And then NumPy will talk about its story. Uh, so for me, it started with SciPy. And my goal was to just help people connect to these wonderful Fortran libraries and give you more utilities, the ability to do ordinary differential equation solving. Uh, integration, special function computation, just all the kinds of things you want to be able to do very quickly at a high level in Python that you couldn't do in, in 2001. Uh, of course, any of these large projects that exist, they do start with a few people, but they don't survive and they don't grow unless a lot of people get involved. And that's true for every project I've been a part of uh, that has succeeded. SciPy certainly started in 1998 with some of the work I did. And then in 2001, we put it together into SciPy with some of my colleagues, Piaru and Eric. And then uh, today it's sustained by 670 contributors. Of course, there's a power law. It's about five or 10, maybe 10, 15 uh, significant contributors, and then a whole lot of other people helping to make it work. Um, my open source addiction that started with SciPy uh, continued with NumPy while I was a professor, and that uh, now is supported by a very large community of 708 contributors and a, and a growing number of core developers. Uh, it's, it's astonishing to me, actually, just how successful NumPy has been compared to what I imagined. I knew I wanted to bring communities together and allow an ecosystem to develop, but it's been really humbling and astonishing to see just how much can be accomplished when people work together in a distributed fashion. And that's kind of what um, I want to talk about today is how do people work together in a distributed fashion in a way that's consistent. We still haven't solved the problem here yet, though. I mean, I look back and I'm, I'm, I'm enthused by the success of the users of NumPy and SciPy. And of course, the heartfelt and dedicated effort of many of the contributors, Charles Harris, who's been, you know, Rolf Gomers, Paul Evertanen, 
uh, many, many people who have essentially given all kinds of time to make sure these packages stay consistent. But many, most of them aren't funded. Almost, almost none of them are funded. And so in a day when Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Amazon are funding dozens and dozens of engineers to work in this space, and companies like JP Morgan and Capital One and Bank of America and large investment banks fund thousands of engineers who work with these tools, the fact that there's only a couple of people funded full-time to work and maintain these tools, yeah, there's a problem here, right? It's a problem that I knew about when I got started, but it's, and it's something I've been trying to figure out how to fix the whole time. Um, but it is a problem. There's no funding, you know, if the people that create this don't have funding, they're just kind of trying to figure out what they do. Everyone uses their stuff, but there's no way to continue working on it uh, without some kind of connected support. Um, GPU support could have been added to NumPy five years ago, six years ago, easily, but it wasn't. So instead we have kind of other array libraries showing up to provide that GPU support. SciPy took 17 years to hit 1.0, right? Not because the people are lazy, <laughs> because they didn't have jobs. They were just working full in their nights and weekends. And that, that's fine when you're talking about a hobbyist project, but once projects start getting used at scale, it doesn't work anymore. It just doesn't work anymore. And so uh, NumPy could already be a 2.0, but not without full-time guidance and leadership and projects to support it. So that's a real problem. And uh, NumFocus is at the forefront of trying to help fix this problem. And uh, there are other approaches as well. This all gets to the, part, the, to the problem of OS sustainability, open source sustainability, open source software sustainability. And what happens is developers get burned out. And I guess my voice being raspy right now has an extra effect, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't intentional. <laughs> we're all burned out, we're miserable. No, it's not true. Um, but it, it is true that people sometimes sacrifice, and I don't recommend this, but in fact, I recommend the opposite. Uh, one of the reasons I've been able to sustain so long in open source activities because I haven't, work-life harmony is important. Having other things outside of your life that, that you care about is important. Uh, but, but it's easy to get burned out, and I've seen this, and I've experienced some of those emotions myself. Developers can live unbalanced lives. There's a lot of, of, of opportunities just living off the generosity of a few. I'm not here to make you feel guilty. I'm here to talk about how do we fix this. Because ultimately, it's aligned incentives that make it work. Nobody's doing this intentionally. Nobody's trying to hurt anybody. We're all just using stuff that we can use and, and making our local decisions. So how do we fix it? And that's kind of what I've been interested in for a long time. Um, this is a very personal journey for me. And as I have explained, I've been eyes wide open to this for 20 years. I've known about the problems that can exist with the uh, tragedy of the commons, with common utilities, and I've been very interested in it. I spoke earlier about my addiction to open source, and it's kind of true. I've really got a passion for contributing to open source. I love the community building. I love the fact that people can share ideas across the world instantly once they're created. So I love participating in OSS, but I have to do it sustainably. So I don't have to really think theoretically about this. I just have to look at my kids and the fact that they need more and more funding, it appears. Uh, now they're going now they're at college age, and, and uh, it's, it seems to get more expensive every year. Uh, so I have to do it sustainably. And I want to do that in a way that other people can as well. So of course, many people know about the tragedy of the commons. We're a financial institution. This is probably people here could explain this much better than I could. Uh, but the idea is that if you have a common resource where everybody can just take it, it's really it becomes um, overgrazing and overuse is a, is a known problem. It's called a negative externality of market forces. It's been written about widely. It's very understood. There's a lot of solutions that have emerged. I think there's a lot of solutions that can still emerge. Uh, you look throughout biology, you look throughout nature, and nature solves this problem in lots of ways too. There's all kinds of natural tragedy, the common situations that occur in ecosystems. And lots of solutions arise, actually. Um, there isn't just one. But the problem is real, and if you know these users keep using the commons and don't contribute back, then eventually it, it, it doesn't work. So you know, one analogy, if the grass is open source developers and the sheep are the users of open source, we're just using it and then not really helping to maintain it, not sponsoring new ones, not encouraging new ones, not, not uh, providing for the uh, support of the, of, the, of the open source developers, then pretty soon you have these wilted and dead open source developers uh, who are kind of worn out. And then uh, in addition, I think you, you, and probably the biggest problem is that you don't have examples that show how working in open source can be prosperous. Now we have a couple. Obviously Red Hat uh, had a great big exit to IBM. We've had other open source companies get an exit. And I think they're, they're approximate answers. I think they're, 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 they're steps in the right direction. I think there's many other folks that are making steps in the right direction. But it is a real issue. 
Um, and I think it's actually pretty deep. I don't think our educational or political system is really helping. Um, a lot of the fundamentals of profit, money, how free markets coordinate the scarce resources is widely misunderstood. A lot of people, there are people who would sort of, they, they look askance at the fact that there are some people making money in open source and they get nervous about that. You know, it's either all free or, or it's like, Socialism, capitalism, that's the only two options you've got, right? Which is just, I just agree with that. I think that's the, that's the wrong framing for the problem. Um, I think the right framing starts with recognizing that profit and money are principles of human cooperation at scale. We all understand computing at scale. Do we think about human cooperation at scale? And how is that accomplished? How do you actually coordinate the resources of millions of people without having a single point of control? How do you do that? I don't know that there's perfect, but we can observe that profit, that profit motive, sort of am I making sense of the world? Am I doing something with my resources that other people are, are liking so that I'm making a profit? Is it working? And money is that coordinating tool, is, it works. It's known to work for thousands of years. How, do, how, how else do you coordinate the behavior of millions of people across nations, across political spectrums, across belief systems? I don't know of any other system that works as well. So we need much better dialogue. Of course, it's not perfect. Didn't say it was. It is a, nothing is perfect, and if you're open source, you recognize that too. For years, I look at NumPy and I see all the warts, and so I'm proud of the accomplishments, but I'm also embarrassed sometimes. I look and say, who's the idiot that wrote this stuff? Uh, because it should be much better. And uh, that happens all the time. And it's, I think most things are like that. It's not one or the other, it's a mix. And we have to have better dialogue. It's not about capitalism or socialism. Um, it's about connecting aligned incentives and helping people who are in open source uh, continue to be able to work in open source. My perspective, business and open source are about people. They're really the same thing. They're about competing to cooperate with each other. They're about voluntary connections. And that's the power. To me, those are the powerful dynamics that I'm looking for in life. I'm looking for situations where you can be voluntarily engaged with folks. Nobody's coerced into that relationship. They can step away from it if it's not working for them anymore. And what I see throughout my life in open source and business is the very same thing. And I love helping people. And so I love both of these scenarios and both these environments. I've been trying to figure out how do we connect these two in a deep way. Give a little background as how I came to some of these views. Uh, so I started as a grad student, 1997, 1999, at the Mayo Clinic, and I encountered Linux. I started to install Linux. I went, oh, this is great. I could write C code. I could read other people's code. I loved it. Of course, Richard Stallman had a lot of great essays about free software and the power of ideas when freely shared. And I loved reading his literature. I, I read everything he had, most everything he wrote. Uh, and then I came across something he wrote that I realized I couldn't, I couldn't agree with. Uh, he, sort of, he said, I therefore urge you to do as I have done and have no children. Uh, so it was a little too late for me. I already had three, uh, so I couldn't send them back. <laughs> and they were, they were darling, actually. I loved them, and, they, and, and I, I, they're amazing. And I'm really grateful I've had, I had those kids. And I would not urge you. Um, some people won't, some people can. I mean, it's, it's an orthogonal question. You know, and I don't think they should be related. Um, so I did read Eric Raymond. I think he had some really good things to say about the power of connected, you know, many eyeballs, just, uh, debugging. It sort of got me excited. I then experienced the power of open source by grabbing and learning Unix by building a, a mini cluster with a bunch of uh, Macs. Just the maverick ability to grab code and read it and understand it. I could read the Python code base, learn from the great, the, the great developers that are there. And me as a scientist who knew enough about C and programming to be dangerous, but never having really taken computer science, I could really rapidly understand more and more by reading the code. So it was a great, great environment for learning. Of course, questions I had led to more questions, and that's sort of the continuation of, if you read Zen and the Art of motor Motorcycle Maintenance, that's kind of its main premise, is that questions always lead to more questions. There's really never answers. Uh, there are answers, but there's more questions. So it's good news, actually, because answering questions gives a little endorphin kick, and it's neurobiological, actually, so one, you know, d be addicted to getting questions answered. Uh, that's kind of part of the addiction to open source, you're addicted to that endorphin kick of actually having, doing something for people, having it related, finding out an answer to something. It's, it's a wonderful thing, and one of the good kinds of addictions that we can have in our life. Uh, so it led to questions like, how do I work on open source software while still providing for my family? Uh, I was a young graduate student working on SciPy. My wife thought I was supposed to be finishing grad school. We were making $18,000 a year. Uh, I had three kids. Don't ask me how we did that. Probably because it was Minnesota, not Boston, not Cambridge. Um, but she was thinking I was going to finish soon, and I kind of delayed it by a year. Because uh, all of 1999, I took writing SciPy, basically. Um, so, but I had that question. I knew I couldn't do that forever. So how do I do this? And still, and how do others do this? Um, 
So that led me to understand how do economies work? How do you make people better off generally? So I just did my own personal study on that and tried to find all the information I could. That led me to Austrian econ economics. I'm not gonna give you a lecture on Austrian economics. I'm going to, uh, it's, uh, it's not one group of thought. There's a bunch of writers, some of them brilliant, others a little bit uh, tedious, uh, a little bit hard to understand. But there's some really good thought that's gone on that there by a lot of smart people trying to grapple with this problem as well. And I like the first principles. I like the concepts that they, they emerged. Some of the key takeaways I took from my study of some of these writers, like Frederick Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, Jesus Huerta de Soto, I, I, found, I, I learned that coordinating power of money and profits, just the ability to help humans cooperate at scale, that was a powerful idea that I hadn't heard of anywhere else. Uh, it's sort of been absent from education. And I think it's absent from a lot of other people's education. And it causes us to have bad dialogue because we have to recognize that power. If we're going to replace it with something else, we've got to replace it with, with what? We've got we to come to the table knowing what, what's working and what's there. Um, I also learned that entrepreneurs are critical. You need people experimenting in the market, trying to figure out what people want and trying to tr it's trying stuff out. And you need a lot of them. You need to support them. You need to help them when they fail ultimately and, and encourage that, that process. Uh, I really wasn't, I wasn't born an entrepreneur, I would say. I was um, educated into it. I sort of saw the light as the need for it and said, I better try to do that. And so I've been working at that, you know, for the past uh, 12, 15 years. I also learned about the structure of capital. The structure of capital is not just one big pool. There's, the pool is tied up into all kinds of inventory, into infrastructure, and, that, and how it's structured matters and leads to uh, challenges. Um, and, you know, structure of capital is actually part of, and a bigger question is the structure of relationships. And you start looking at open source communities, the structure of those communities starts to matter. And who people are and who they're connected to starts to matter. So more takeaways. Uh, voluntary trade requires win-win situations. Uh, that's, in order for someone to trade with you, they have to agree, and you have to agree. So you both have to see it as valuable, assuming there's aren't any coercive elements around forcing the conversation, which still happens. I'm not naive to that. Um, but I love, I found that I love finding win-win situations. It's actually really fun trying to figure out, hey, we both benefit, this is great. And finding those is kind of the essence of entrepreneurship at scale. Uh, a lot of people searching for those win-win situations, that's entrepreneurs by a trial and error, basically. That's how we make economic progress. We don't make economic progress without that energy. So societies that encourage that get more of it and then get more business growth. It's really not about big companies, little, little people. It's about lots of entrepreneurs uh, and sort of encouraging those entrepreneurs. Yes, externalities and traps do occur. You can be an entrepreneur that, entrepreneur that effectively traps people in their addictions, not supportive of that. You can be an entrepreneur that sort of uh, games the system. And there are people that do that, not a big fan of that. There are definitely things you can do that aren't, that I would say are not good. So I think good is bigger than this. These are just sort of uh, functions. They're like little subroutines that can be applied. Why you should apply them and when, it's a bigger question and something that can be debated uh, and should be. I don't have all the answers. Uh, nobody else does either. Uh, but ideas and attitude does matter. How people, how you think about your situation totally affects what you're going to do about it. Uh, many people get trapped before they get started. Uh, there, are different, there are different people with risk profiles. I think risk aversion is one. Obviously, one of the big hard things about entrepreneurship is it takes some risk. Uh, I was asked in India when I gave a talk, somebody says, when should you start a business? And the Indians are great. They're wonderful people. A lot of risk aversion there. A lot of, um, I think there's a lot of family dynamics that cause people not to, you know, they don't want to look bad. Because you, you, you start a company, you start anything, and it might not go well. Uh, there's a lot of things out of your control. There are definitely things you can control, but a whole lot of things you can't. And so uh, the ideas you have, the risk aversion you have can definitely matter. So that, that was kind of the fabric, the framework. I kind of learned those principles while I was getting my PhD, and then I ended up in, in school teaching. I went back to my alma mater and taught at a university professor, and I kind of realized that I learned all this wonderful stuff about business and the world and entrepreneurship, and it really wasn't matching with a career in academia. So I sometimes say I sacrificed tenure to write NumPy, but that isn't only half of the story. Uh, I knew I really wasn't meant for academia as soon as I realized that I had this desire to connect communities in open source and to connect businesses and to kind of help figure out some way to add in, in, in some way if possible to that story of making incentive businesses that worked compatibly with open source uh, communities. Um, under, underneath it all is this powerful idea that when you share it, when you create something and share it with the world, everybody can use it. The group can use it, the world can use it. 
Uh, it has been absolutely um, amazing to be able to travel the world and, and notice there are people, poor people, rich people, doesn't matter, people with all kinds of, who have all of a sudden a lift because they can use software that otherwise they wouldn't have got their hands on. And they can not only just use it, they can contribute to it. They can take the next step to become contributors to actually grow in their ecosystems, whether it's South America or India or even Africa. I'm so excited there's a pike on Africa emerging, uh, not just in South Africa, where there's been infrastructure for a while, but in Ghana, in uh, Ethiopia. Some of these areas, people can get become contributors and meaningful contributors to the community. That's a powerful idea and something I'm super excited about. So all that effort kind of led to this enormous sort of ecosystem, uh, which is only happened because of other individuals. Like, uh, it's, it's humbling to be a part of it, but I totally recognize it's the strength and the power of everybody else that made this happen. And that's the power of groups. As I said, I've been, all that learning happened 20 years ago. Right, and I knew when I was writing SciPy and NumPy, I, I'm not sure how this is gonna work. Uh, I'm not really sure, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm not sure, so I effectively starting right after I left academia, I mean, academia was part of it. He would support open source by having a research lab, by having people that could work on it, and, and funding, um, funding professors, funding uh, graduate students. So I knew theoretically about the potentials of negative externalities. I knew the problem of the tragedy of the commons. I knew that this may happen. Uh, I knew that business solutions would need to be found, um, but, I jumped into it. I believe in people. I believe in the coordinating power of shared ideas. I believe solutions can be found that enable us to build sustainably on the power of shared code, shared data, shared ideas. Uh, stay tuned for 2019. I've actually had some interesting epiphanies over the, over the past few weeks. Uh, they're not developed enough for me to share with you right now, <laughs> but I'm very excited about some of the things we're gonna be doing in 2019 that I think can meaningfully uh, uh, affect this over the next five years. Uh, they're meaningful, but they're mountainous. Right? They're not simple hacks. They're actually things that could that will take a while to emerge, but they're worth pursuing. So I'm excited about that as, a, as something to pursue for the next five to 10 years. So I thought I'd tell you about little early efforts I did and kind of some of the experience I had and see if that can help resonate with you or you can learn from. So when I was at BYU, uh, teaching as a professor, Brigham Young University, in the electrical engineering department, I was continuing work on SciPy. It's been before I started the NumPy effort, which I started as a professor there. Uh, and sci I would have, I hired graduate students and they'd work on things like SciPy Sparse and the uh, iterative algorithms in, in the uh, iterate, SciPy Iterate and SciPy Special. And I try to figure out how to fund them. And uh, knowing what I knew about entrepreneurship and wanting to kind of participate in the, in the world of shared ideas and the world of, of voluntary exchange, I wanted to build a research lab on the basis of individual uh, individual contributions. Um, so I, uh, that's a difficult undertaking, by the way. <laughs> that's sort of how I learned firsthand about the, what, it, what it takes to get donors, how difficult that can be, some of the challenges associated with it. Uh, I made a DVD, I, you know, one of the principles is, hey, you can give somebody something and then they might give back to you. So I made a DVD, my wife's a beautiful singer, we made a, a recording and uh, put a DVD out and I gave that to about a thousand people and just asked for donations to my lab, right? And I got about five five thousand bucks, right, from that uh, campaign. Right, it was it was not huge, but it was meaningful. It was helpful, um, and so that kind of uh, you know was one experience. Then I wrote when I wrote NumPy, kind of thinking about man, how I'm going to fund this, how I'm going to help it. Well, maybe I could write a book, and that was a known way to kind of raise money. As you write document, you write a book, you write a book, you sell, and then some money is raised from the book. And it was at the time, you know, self-publishing. You could self-publish. I'm not recommending you always self-publish. I think the publishers have a great value add that they provide. At the time, I really didn't want to deal with that. I wanted to. I was spending too much time on the software, so I published it myself. Uh, and I kind of invented this new concept called the market determined copyright time. Uh, it really is going back to the principle of copyright and patents. Originally, their whole idea was for a, for a short period of time. They're gonna allow the government to basically force everybody not to copy, sort of allow the government to force people not to do something that comes naturally, which is just copy what you have, but only for limited time, right? That was the whole principle. Like for a period of time, we'll allow that to try to encourage them to make money off of that idea. Now, copyright's gone way out of control. It was originally 14 years with an extension. Now it's crazy. Um, patents, I think they're, they're reasonable, but their challenge is it's different things are, need to be, have different patents, and not everything should be patented that's being patented. Um, nonetheless, I like the idea, so I said, hey, we'll do it this way. I need uh, $250,000, right, for the funding of NumPy, right? So I'm going to 
uh, release this as soon as I make that much money off of the book. Right, that was the idea. So I put it out there and said it'll be free, or four years. If I can't do it in four years, then it's not worth it. So uh, that was kind of the principle. And you know, it, it worked to a degree. I actually had a pretty good response. 3,000 people bought the book, raised about $90,000. Um, half of that, uh, two thirds of that went to graduate student. Who The one graduate student I had from China who was uh, finishing his PhD, I was able to fund him because of that. And uh, then the rest covered a summer for me. And then, but after six months, you know, pretty much about two years in, I got a job in the industry at a company called Enthought. And so I made the material public domain because it was sort of not, it made more sense for what I was doing then just to make the material free. Uh, and then also it became the foundation of the sci-fi documentation project. So I don't know that that's the right answer. Obviously, I don't think any of these things are the right answer. They're really just explorations that I'm, teaching, I'm, I'm sharing with you so you can help me figure out better answers and also figure them out for yourself. Um, so then I went to Enthought. Enthought was the first consulting job I took. I went to a company in Austin, Texas. It was the same, uh, founded by the same individual who helped me create sci-fi to begin with. And in 2001, so I joined them 2008, 2007. And I was joining so I could grow NumPy and sci-fi. That's what I was passionate about. I wanted to go there, figure out a way to fund that by doing consulting work, and then we could fund NumPy and SciPy together. And so um, it turned out that SciPy and NumPy work was nights and weekends, not just for me, but for a few other people that joined for kind of the same reason. We did manage to grow a great conference series in SciPy Conference that benefited both the community and it was a marketing benefit to the company, so it was a, a, reason, it was a good trade. Um, couldn't really connect much contract work directly. We were successful at doing that. The, contract work that was obtained was primarily around the Unthought tool suite. So even though it is true you can build an open source company off of, you can build a kind of consulting company off of open source, that's one way to do it. Unthought was actually doing it off of the Unthought tool suite as open source based, not NumPy, SciPy really. So that was one of the challenges. Um, there are challenges with the, real, with the consulting model. There really isn't a real incentive to produce documentation. Uh, it's, sort of, it's only because you want it and you want users. Uh, but Writing good documentation kind of means you're writing, you're providing uh, help to people to compete with you. Uh, there's not a real incentive to grow a community of contributors. They end up becoming competitors potentially. So there's some challenges that way. You kind of, to do it, you have to believe fundamentally that by growing the ecosystem, you're growing the pie. And I think ultimately that can work because like, as a consulting company, you recognize you're not gonna, there's no one consulting company that could support the entire sci-fi ecosystem at this point. There isn't, it's too many, it's too diverse. And so you effectively can grow the pie and then have, you, you will grow and at the same time, lots of other people will grow too. So I think you can get around that and this, this idea still can hold merit, but you do have to remember not to make the local decision to not produce documentation or not train people for fear. You know, don't make a decision out of fear, make a decision out of faith that the world, that the market's growing. That's my approach, my recommended approach. It can be difficult to get time to work on open source because when you contract with somebody, they want their project done. And so you have to, you have to work with them. And earlier it was harder, it's getting easier now, but companies were um, not helping themselves by wanting to own all the, all the IP. Hey, your work for hires, everything you do is mine. That's the, natural, that's the standard contract language. The challenge is, okay, do you really want to maintain your own fork of NumPy? Do you really want to maintain your own fork of SciPy or any other open source project? Just surely if we make changes to the code that's open source, we should move that back to open source. Uh, fortunately today, companies are much more enlightened and most of them will agree with that. And it's pretty straightforward, but you do have to fight with their lawyers sometimes. The lawyers still sometimes don't understand that and get a little bit, um, well, this is the way it's always been done. Well, you're wrong, it should be done differently. Um, and not just wrong from my perspective, you're wrong for your, your company, your client. Your client's worse off trying to maintain a fork of an open source project. But it can be a good way. So consulting, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's got a place. It's got a place in, it, many people do it this way, and, and there are many examples of people doing services around open source projects. Of course, at thought I also learned uh, how to fundraise. I learned some kind of clever approaches, perhaps. They're not really that clever, but approaches that aren't as well known to use 401ks, to fund uh, other people's companies, to fund your own company, it's a little trickier. If you're interested in any of this, you know, come talk to me, I'll, I'll, I can guide you, I can give you some ideas about how, to, how this works and how you can basically tap into the capital that's out there. You know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people have access to this kind of capital and you can use it to create organizations and companies that support open source. Um, ultimately it didn't work out for me at Enthought, um, and I needed to leave, that kind of rose other concerns about open source and business, which is, wait, if your open source company is too tied to 
if it's a company and tied to open source, what happens if the company divorces, if the people split? And that's certainly, Eric and I weren't the first to this ever happen to. Uh, it happens all the time and it happens quite regularly. Um, so what does that mean? What does that mean for SciPy? SciPy, does that now mean the, to, to, do the kids have to choose between me and Eric, right? <laughs> it's maybe a bad analogy, but it kind of felt that way. It's like, I didn't, I, I wanted people to be, it didn't matter. And then people don't care. All the people involved in SciPy did not care. They could care less, right? They just want to make sure the conference is working, the libraries work. So I didn't want community participants to have to choose between us. It's one of the reasons when I started Anaconda, which is the second, was the company I founded when I left Anthot, also created NumFocus. And it was really important to me that we create NumFocus as a place to host open source that was community-led, so that um, it was kind of a board that was decided by the community and uh, grown by the community. Now, I, now it's really hard to, do, to build one company, and here we were building two organizations at once. And it was hard, uh, definitely hard. There was a lot of people were confused a little bit. They were saying, wait, is NumFocus Travis's little thing? Is it sort of some, some trick to get us to contribute and then somehow he's gonna take it? I mean, there were lots of people, with, there were naysayers for sure. Uh, after a couple of years, people could see, no, this is real. This is actually a real community-centric organization and he's got his company, this is other thing. And they're separated. Um, but they each have a different role to play. Anaconda, the goal was to build a product-based company that would drive revenue that could be reinvested back in open source. Right, that was the goal of Anaconda and still is. Um, it still is my goal for Anaconda. Um, PyData NumFocus was meant to be an organization led by the community that could go where the community wanted it to go effectively. So NumFocus and community-centric organizations I think are critical to the future and have been critical to the past. Uh, fortunately, Peter Wang, my co-founder at Anaconda and the other investors agreed, allowed us to kind of grow um, and start NumFocus so that we could continue to grow it. And about, since about 2014, 2015, it's been pretty independent and been growing thanks to the work of Leah and the, her staff, as well as uh, Andy Terrell and the new board and, and the old board and all the people that have gone before are volunteers. We founded it in 2012 with Perry Greenfield and Fernando Perez and John Hunter and Jared Millman uh, and uh, Anthony Skopatz helped us open the first bank account. Remember those early days, it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, 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 there, there are times, some people ask me, how do, how do you do this? How do you make sure it's gonna work? You know, I don't know, there's some times when I know something's gonna work, I just, you just, I'm just persistent. This is gonna work, it doesn't matter, we'll get through it. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's hiccups, there's problems, we'll get through it because this is gonna work and it's the right thing that needs to exist. So, and I don't have that confidence with everything, but with NumFocus I did, I knew this is the right thing and partly because of the support of, the, of Fernando, the critical mass of people that were associated with it and then because of the, of the staff that worked on it. And then the PyData, the PyData we discovered Sort of one of the first things we did with NumFocus was discover that PyData was this untapped energy, latent energy. Um, Anaconda was the company founded with Peter and, uh, and I. Uh, it was renamed Anaconda and roughly at the same time when it was uh, sort of control of the company is now in the hands of the board, which is led by uh, Lanham Napier, who's the chairman, and then uh, a new CEO, Scott Collison. So Anaconda is a, is, is a different company. It's an enterprise software company, a growing company, great services, great products, check them out. Uh, but it's different. Uh, uh, that's potentially a good thing uh, in terms of uh, raising more resources. Um, lessons from NumFocus. Raising money from donors is hard. Most people just don't give if, they're, if they aren't getting something. Uh, just think of your own behavior, think of my behavior. It's, you know, you're not, money's scarce, right? That's your representation in the world. You vote with your money all the time and it's hard just to hand that over to somebody, kind of, well, what is this? Uh, companies struggle to do it too. It's a, uh, when John Hunter passed away, another example, I've had a previous example with donors trying to fund my lab. When John Hunter passed away in 2012, uh, suddenly, it was he just helped us start NumFocus, gave a keynote talk at SciPy, uh, contracted colon cancer, and passed away within a month. It's tragic for the community. Um, and uh, his wife left his wife with three kids, so we basically did a campaign trying to raise money for his widow. Uh, over over the course of three or four weeks, maybe it was, maybe it was three months. Ultimately, most of it came in early, but we ended up raising about ninety thousand uh, dollars. So that's very nice to be able to hand a check to his widow. Um, but it was also a little disappointing. But I knew there were millions of Matplotlib users, and yet, you know, and it was very power law distributed. Some gave, you know, some few gave a lot, and a few gave what they could. Uh, you know, and again, this isn't to make you feel guilty, but it is to make you observe that this isn't magic. Um, you know, uh, you don't have to raise your hand, but ask, you, ask yourself, how many of you are sustaining members of Unfocus, right? Uh, it's a fairly simple thing to do, monthly donation, Unfocus. 
you know, five bucks a month doesn't hurt anybody. Most people can do that, but who takes the time to do it? Uh, but when you do, it's meaningful and it adds up in aggregate significantly. So it is hard, but, you, but it's worth it. There's always some available there and you can keep pushing on that. Uh, hurting cats is hard too. Also lessons from numb focus help me understand the challenge of organizing human behavior at scale as well. Um, I actually learned this as a professor. If you've never been in a faculty meeting with a bunch of smart people, uh, you don't, you under, and, and many of you have been in meetings, when you have too many smart people around the room, actually less gets done. <laughs> it's kind of this odd phenomena of, of alignment. Uh, it's one reason I think uh, it's, it's kind of the human equivalent of software services, software as a service or service oriented architecture. Uh, effectively, you have to have small groups of people with APIs connecting to each other because you can't get a group of people, really more than seven. And there's a great article actually that came out this summer from Harvard Business Review. You know, the most productive meetings have fewer than eight people. And that's interesting because it matches my statement of I didn't want NumFocus board to have more than seven. Uh, and I was pretty adamant about that. Now, that didn't happen. Also, showing that NumFocus isn't my organization, it's an organization of the community. I was pretty adamant that it had you know, five to seven people on the board just for this reason, just to allow it to be efficient in its decision making and, and action. Um, it's really hard. You can definitely maintain standards by committee, but it's really hard to innovate with a large group. Uh, so consensus-led development is a myth, right? Development happens with individuals, and then you um, then sort of organize those individuals together. Again, I don't understand all the issues here. I definitely understand some of the problems, and it has to do with our neuroscience. It has to do with who we are as humans, and we're still learning. What really happened for NumFocus and how it became sustainable, it was a bit of a, it was a, bit of a risk. I raised 2.25 million for Continuum from about 30 investors, right? By hook and by crook, I'm scattering around, grabbing money from people whoever I can to start this crazy thing. And uh, Peter Wang, who is also my co-founder, we agreed that we would be able to fund NumFocus for its first year, you know, two, three years, uh, by basically paying for administrative development and you know, not knowing where any money was coming from, just taking it from our investors, basically. And then, um, we, we got money from investors not because they like us or because they're, you know, they, were, they were wanting to donate to the, good, to the cause. We got it because they, they, they thought they'd make money back, right? That's, that's what investors do. Investors give you money because they're gonna make, you're going to make them money back. That means you have to have a business model. It means you have to have something you're selling. Uh, you have to figure out how to do that. Uh, we were able to actually return 6x return to those investors in three years. Uh, using the you know Rob Peter to pay Paul principle, uh, the same way most of us make money in the stock market today, uh, go you know it's the to sell to the next guy, right uh, at a higher price. Um, but of course those new people are going to pay the higher higher price because they believe in the future. They believe what you built and where it's going to go. And so you you know there is a lot of narrative building for companies. Numfocus didn't have that ability. Numfocus can't go out and get investors and say hey come invest and we're going to actually I think we may be able to change that. Um, so stay tuned next year. <laughs> but for now, it's not, that's, that's difficult and, diff and, not, and hard. We found, actually Van Lindbergh said, told us that the, at PyCon was basically the way that PSF got funded. And so we let, after that conversation, we said, well, hey, maybe PyData can be the same. Maybe, Py, maybe PyData can be the engine that helps the admin of NumFocus stay afloat. So at least it can stay consistent. And we found that was true. Not initially. We lost a lot of money on PyData initially. Uh, but by about 2014, yeah, it worked. And you could basically bear, you know, survive barely. And so that was part of getting NumFocus on its foot and on its feet. So I'm gonna have a, a couple more minutes uh, to learn some of the lessons from Continuum days. So at Continuum, we tried many product models. Our goal at Continuum was to build a product company and we didn't know what to build. We didn't know what it would be. I had some ideas, array servers, NumPy in the cloud, and some kind of basic concepts that we sold to investors. And uh, some of them worked out. We didn't really understand, we didn't really think of the distribution model. We didn't think of what became our actual product that was successful until we got started. That's also a principle of, of you kind of got to start with something and then pivot and then listen to the market and, and move the direction the market wants you to. So we tried uh, SaaS models, software as a service models, Wakari and a kind of cloud. Wakari was the very first J uh, Jupyter in the cloud uh, solution and it existed in 2013. Right, uh, and we paid the price for that. <laughs> Jupiter wasn't ready for you in the cloud in 2013. There wasn't, this was pre-Docker, it was pre all these facilities that make it a lot easier today. But we were uh, innovating, trying to make something happen. And Acona Cloud, um, and I have lots to say about SaaS models. If you're interested in any of this, I'm happy to talk with you. I'm, in fact, what I'm doing now is I'm mentoring people in building companies. Uh, I would love to see many, many more companies being built around open source. I'd love to talk to anybody who wants to do that. Like I said, I, the value of entrepreneurs is real. And I'd love to encourage more of them. And so I'd love to help any, any of the lessons I've learned. I'd love to help you 
build your company if you're so inclined. Um, we had an open core model with Number, core, Number Pro, IO Pro, MQL Optimize. We were experimenting with that. We did consulting services and training. That's, and that's really good for a non-VC-backed business. You really can't do consulting and training for a VC-backed business. It just doesn't work. Uh, but it's good for a bootstrap or a startup business where you're not getting VC funding. We did grants, an open source research lab. We've got grants from DARPA, uh, got money from uh, various sources, to, and that can generate resources. We finally found the complementary product model. Basically, it's the product that you sell when the open source thing is, is popular. So you have an open source thing that's used and the demand for a complementary product grows. And that's kind of a model that's known to work. It's kind of my favorite uh, software model uh, that supports open source is sell the complementary product. I still believe those complementary products have to stay ahead. There's a constant churn because a lot of the features of the complementary product ultimately become open source. Um, and so that's, there's a bit of strategizing and work to build the right one. You definitely need venture funding to scale marketing and sales. Uh, they're critical to the business. Uh, gross margins on a product are great, but operating costs will kill you. Uh, initial operating costs will kill you. It takes, a, it takes a while for the operating costs to be efficient so the gross margins on product actually help you. Consulting is the opposite. Your operating costs are smaller, your gross margins are smaller, but your operating costs are smaller too. And explaining that to, to VCs is hard. Um, so having you know, two consulting and product companies, which we had, I was running two businesses for a long time at Anaconda, and actually, but uh, not, not uh, differentiating the, the, the financials. And so building a narrative around our businesses was difficult. And the narrative around your business is actually essential. You know, as a leader of a business, your narrative is almost the most important thing you're doing uh, to create the concept that's causing uh, people to think and, and organize around your work. So aligning investors to open source is hard. Got to pick the right investors, pick the right metrics. Uh, you got to bring in outside help. You're not going to be able to do it alone. Uh, no matter how brilliant, capable you are, it's the team that does it together. And so uh, most of uh, building a business around open source is about team building and having the right people on the team. That's actually true of open source projects as well. Good open source projects become good because of the team they, could, they attract, not because of any one particular. I see a lot of open source projects with one really, really great developer that don't grow as quickly because the team doesn't grow. All right, so uh, I realize I'm, I'm running out of time. Got more things to say, as you might imagine. <laughs> um, I'll give you just a little, little brief window on what we're doing now. Uh, just as kind of uh, learning from the past, organizing for the future. Quantsite's uh, go-to-market business is about connecting companies to communities. We're basically the group that helps organizations connect with communities and try to figure out how to, how to interface with them. You can almost say a lobbying group to the open source. Uh, companies kind of have their cycle and they spin really at this rate. Open source communities kind of spin at this rate and then you need someone to help transform those gears. Uh, that's what we do. And we help them around the problem of data science and AI and machine learning. It's built from the same team that uh, the, many of the same management members that created Continuum have joined me to spin out uh, Quonsite. We actually consider Anaconda to be our first spin out company and NumFocus to be our first spin out nonprofit, right? So it's the same group and we're basically doing this again but intentionally organizing to build other companies and spin out other organizations. So our whole goal is to spit out more and more companies and have a portfolio of people that we're helping. Our core business at Quantsite is Quantsite Labs membership, sustainable open source partnerships, custom data science and machine learning consulting, and staffing, mentoring and training. We're embracing the concept that open source is about learning and growing and teaching, and that there's a, a big shortage of people in the world who need that help, and that that shortage isn't fixed by a 12-week course, it's fixed by years of engagement, by apprenticeships, and by working together to train the next generation. So we do consulting, AI, ML, on big data, Jupiter everywhere, big believers in Jupiter Lab. We think a lot of the world can be replaced by, a lot of the world's software can be replaced by plugins to Jupiter Lab. And then optimizing Python, a lot of Python's out there being deployed in, an, in, a, in a suboptimal way, we can help make it better. Our partnerships in open source are interesting, I think. And they're just evolving, but this is where we help companies connect with communities. And we help them in a couple of ways. We help them prioritize their needs. So uh, we help companies, instead of spending millions of dollars on internal projects that are effectively forks of open source, don't do that. Actually take less than the money you're gonna spend internally, spend it on supporting open source so that there's a shared R&D gets built and you can build your pieces on top, but with a more sustainable approach. Hire from the community. A lot of uh, hiring dollars are spent, recruiting dollars are spent that could be spent on promoting open source projects and then hiring the people that join those projects. Um, get open source support. We have a support and maintenance 
uh, approach that we provide uh, for the uh, particular set of uh, you know, the NumPy ecosystem, and then applying lessons of open source, helping people internally do the things that make open source companies successful. We have a webinar we host. This is to help communities project to companies their roadmaps or their wish lists or where they're headed. A lot of communities have things they're doing, but companies don't know about it. So the open source webinar is one part of an answer to help grow that information transfer, publicize these roadmaps. It's recorded, transcribed, so you can attend the webinar or you can just watch the pre-recorded or, or read the transcripts of the, pre of the previous sessions. We have a Quantsite Labs, which is our research and, and uh, uh, lab, basically, where we train people, where we work on hard problems. The goal is to hire the, the PyData core team. Uh, we'd love to have the PyData core team at, at Quantsite Labs, or at least a subset of it. Uh, improve the connection to NumPy, of NumPy to ML frameworks, GPU support, improve the foundations of array computing, Jupyter Lab, data catalog standards, packaging. These are a list of the things we've already identified as areas we're working on, and we'll work on more. Uh, two projects, URA and XND. You'll hear more about those if you come to the talk that Saul and I are giving later today. Um, so I won't say more about that. We work on Apache Arrow. We work on XND. XND is a generalization of NumPy. To um, learn more about that in the talk, basically pandas is to Arrow as NumPy is to XND. For people that want to know the relationship, that's a pretty high level way. Unified Array Interface, we'll talk more about that later. JupyterLab, won't really talk much about this later, but if you're not using JupyterLab today, you should really take a hard look at it. If you're building basically custom dashboards without leveraging JupyterLab, I would take a hard look at that and see if you're basically going in a direction that's gonna be uh, less sustainable than if you're writing plugins to JupyterLab. I think there's some really good software that's gone on here for the past couple of years. A lot of really good uh, technology has been built. Uh, we're big supporters of Conda Forge. I have folks, the Conda Forge community is basically a distributed community of thousands of developers who create recipes for prepackaged Python and other modules. Uh, Julia, uh, R, there's lots of, anything can be packaged with Conda. And so it's a cross-platform packaging solution. We also incubate young companies. Like I said, my real goal in creating Quantsite is to sponsor lots of entrepreneurs. And so we have uh, in innovative and, uh, uh, approaches to helping open source young companies get started. Uh, we've already spun out uh, companies before. We kind of, I kind of know some of, the, some of the ways, and believe me, companies are as broad, I don't know all the things, but I'm happy to share what I do know with people that want to build companies based on open source. We have a small venture fund called Quantsite Initiate that we've started that can actually find funding for these companies as well. So we, all, we already have you know, three young companies that are incubating inside of our portfolio. We're open to more. And uh, openteams.io, uh, if you want to go check it out, it's very nascent, very new, uh, not really ready for you to use daily, but we'd love you to check it out and give us feedback. The intent of Open Teams is to be a, a find collaborators, advisors, and help your open source projects grow and build a network of people around open source, and then build your open source portfolio showing the availability for commercial work, available for other open source projects. Try it out, give us feedback. That's all I'm asking right now. I'm, I'm guarantee it's not gonna be that useful to you. It might be a little useful, but try it out and give us feedback uh, and look for more in 2019. All right, appreciate that. I got went over a little bit over time, so maybe you have time just for a couple of questions. Uh, if you'd like to go and take a break, I think that's the, the time is now. Uh, but if you have time if you have questions, I'm happy to take a couple. Thank you. No brave souls, either that or I couldn't understand anything I said, which may be likely. <laughs> Okay, no problem. Uh, can't see if anybody's, oh, there we go, right here in the front. There's a microphone here if you can use it. I'll also repeat the question, unless you use the microphone. Uh, thank you so much first. And my question is, uh, as you can see, uh, some libraries, uh, uh, because it's open source um, uh, and it's out of the market like Theorno, uh, and no one continue to contribute to those kind of platforms. Um, one of my pipeline is heavily depending on uh, Theorno. Uh, and uh, fortunately and unfortunately, I have to rewrite everything uh, to TensorFlow or something else. Um, 
I, I really wish we can uh, ask uh, uh, someone from corporate, I wish to save us some time uh, to change a library. Uh, we wish the, um, uh, is, do you think is there any other opportunities to, um, uh, for example, uh, for your company to contribute to some of the great libraries existing in the history, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have other contributors continuously serve, it, serve this com uh, kind of library. Yeah, I would love to. I mean, that's really the goal of Quonsai Labs. Is we're, we have an active campaign going out to companies to basically tell them the story of they've got a time bomb. They've got a ticking time bomb. If you're depending on the NumPy ecosystem, you have a ticking time bomb if you have no plan for its support. Because the world is moving, and you know maybe that time scale is five years, maybe it's 10 years, but eventually you're going to have to rewrite your code or why, instead of that problem, which could be tens of millions of dollars for, every, for a particular company, a little, pay a little insurance to fund a, a group of people who are maintaining that code. Because right now there's nobody really formally maintaining that code. So Quantsite Labs, yes, I would love to uh, hire people. I'd love to have a team of 100 people. And I think it's possible. There's certainly, we started that at Continuum. We saw, the, we saw uh, hints that it could work. And so we're just pursuing that actively over the next year or two to see if we can't build up a team of 15, 20, 30 people who are able to spend their time supporting projects that are used, like the Ano. The Ano is a perfect example of one that really deserves somebody to maintain it and love to do it. Uh, so that's the goal. We're out trying to basically raise money from companies. Uh, so each together, not any one company has to spend a ton of money, but together they can spend a little bit and then support the ecosystem. A oh, great question. The other question. Hi. Oh. Yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on uh, how you can uh, kind of coordinate open source efforts to kind of reduce overlapping and duplicate efforts? That's a good question too. Uh, how to reduce duplicating efforts? Um, I'm less concerned about uh, initial duplication than I used to be in the sense that uh, some duplication is not completely overlapping. Uh, I think information flow is a big one. That's one reason we have the open source directions webinar. I think uh, most people just don't know about the stuff that's out there. Open source has gotten so big that so many people are doing it that it's just, now it's, now it's like an information problem. Um, I think it's, it's best practices kind of, if everybody kind of realizes, you know, do a little Google searching before, do a little searching. I think indexes on open source projects could be helpful. Uh, but ultimately, I only want to prevent duplication that's, that's, that's fueled by lack of information. You know, if somebody really feels strongly that their project is different enough, they want to do it, okay, that's fine. I mean, more, that's better because they're, they're, their framing is a little different. They're going to improve it a little bit better. Uh, I just want to enable reuse. The other thing I think we're working on is uh, kind of interfaces, connection, connective tissue. You know, if you, found, if you form foundational uh, uh, st structures, interfaces, then people can do varying variances, varying degrees of that. Right now we have kind of big silos being built without those interfaces that end up with lots of duplication where we got to be able to find some common ground. So a lot of the times it's actually taking existing duplicated efforts and maybe finding common ground between them and building a, a sub-library. Um, all these things just take time and resources and, and, and coordination, but... Uh, Ah, the question is there could be an or umbrella organization that sort of provides some guidance for that? Yep. Yep. So there's lots of, even on our own projects, there's a bunch of duplication. Yeah, I, 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 hear, I hear that and I see that. I think, uh, you know, NumFocus could do things like, help those, or those projects know about each other. I think they, I think they do. Um, I, I don't wanna, a lot of times what looks like duplication isn't, right? I, the, um, there's the Venn diagram doesn't completely overlap, right? And so I think what focus could do is maybe uh, as you see duplicative efforts uh, with the right sponsorship from companies, you know, put grants to form, um, uh, inter like uh, take a piece of that and make a dependency. Make a dependency that's shared. And so then the differences can populate, but then the shared code can also populate. That's one approach. I think NumFocus is perfectly positioned with enough support from enterprise to do those kinds of grants. Yeah, question. 
Um, let's get one question from up here. Oh, great, thank you. Sorry, way in the back. Uh, came in a little late. Uh, you may have addressed this, but um, what's your perspective on how managed services, cloud services, and, and those type of um, changes in the industry uh, affect open source, inter intersect with it, and especially as somebody who's actually tried it once before? <laughs> yeah. Um, managed services, uh, certainly the big players are starting to dominate, right? It's, uh, it's, um, and there's, there's well-known examples of big companies sort of just taking from open source to their managed services, and there's some reactionary responses to that. Some people going as far as trying to create licenses that avoid it. Um, you know, I don't, if someone wants to experiment with licenses, I'm not going to oppose them. I think that's fine. I tend to be a little nervous about that approach because it, um, it creates uh, FUD uh, for the community, um, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, whereas what you need is growth. I actually much more, I, I, I much more appreciate incentivize, incentivizing those open source companies to actually give back to the open source they're depending on and just helping them understand the need. Uh, that, that usually once you can do that effectively, it does start to work. Uh, but it does take good marketing, good, good narrative building, good, good relationships to make that happen. Um, I, I think we're going to see more of it. I think uh, one thing those companies do that's affecting us right now is those big companies then go and actually create their own open source projects. They recognize the power of open source communities and they go try to make their own. Uh, rather than kind of join with the communities that are there, they just invent their own and grow them. And that's creating some uh, opportunities. Certainly there's more software out there, but it's not, it's differently managed. Um, so I think we'll learn from it. I don't have any, uh, uh, you know, I think the best thing to do is keep building business models that incentivize those big companies who use open source to give back to the open source that they, they, they depend on. Do we have time for one more question? Uh, yeah. I, one more question. Final question. So I, I'm coming from an academic sphere, actually, in biomedical engineering, and I'm just wondering um, if you think things have changed in terms of incentives and ways that academics can responsibly contribute, and if they haven't changed much since, since you switched over to the business end more so, um, what can academics do to be responsible users and contributors? That's a great the question. Constraints? That's a great question. Yeah, yeah, of course, academia has been the, fount the fountainhead of a lot of open source and still is, right? Uh, basically, rogue academics and graduate students have been doing this for a while. Uh, I think it has changed to some degree. I do. I think people are recognizing there's a lot, of, there's a lot more journals to publish that take open source projects as, a, as, a, as an entry. And so that helps. If you get a publication out of your work, then that helps your traditional career path. Um, so I think it has changed. I think there are good examples. You know, Fernando Perez has been on the forefront of this. He just got a, a full a professorship, tenure professorship at Berkeley, effectively for his contributions to Jupiter. Uh, so I think that's that's a big deal. That's that's that recognized a lot of folks. I think a bigger deal is also organizations like NSF, NASA, DARPA are recognizing that they are funding a lot of open source and need to be funding a lot of open source. They've kind of had a what I would consider to be a confused perspective on on what they're trying to encourage in the marketplace and they haven't had a place for open source really. It's kind of, they, you know, it's either, it's gotta be proprietary or it, it, they, they've sort of eschewed open source. And then it became, okay, we don't really know what to do with it. And now there's actually active work going to, hey, maybe the things we fund ought to be open source. And that's happening in NASA and NSF and others. So as program managers get up who are familiar with the ecosystem, I think there are, the foundational funding mechanism of academia is changing. And that'll absolutely change academic um, credit you know, value, value statements. So I'm very hopeful, actually. These processes just take time because they're on human time scale. So five, they're a decade, right? And, they're, and, we're, and it's changing, it's getting better. So I expect to see, continue to see in the future a lot of open source come out of academia still. We have a very brief right. question from up here. Okay. Hi, um, how is open source gonna change when, um, at least for um, a, for um, I guess with like the growth of to build models, you need like a lot of data and uh, trying to find like these data sets and trying to find these sources to um, c collect data, uh, you know, like there isn't like a lot of- What half of code is actually data and the data is not available. Right, like, so, or yeah, and then like how is open source going to grow and kind of change when a lot of these open source uh, kind of libraries to like build models and stuff, you need kind of more data. 
Yeah, that's a good question. I think that will be the debate of the future, actually, is open data. Uh, you know, there's some who say that all code will be speed data, there'll be neural nets, and there'll be data training a model that's been trained. I don't believe that's true. I think there'll be a large subset of things that are currently programs that will just be data. And I think that will be a, an interesting debate for the next 20 years. Um, you have two sides of it. You do have people that are promoting open data, and there's incentive to do that. A lot of the big cloud providers actually want to bring you to their cloud by giving you data. So I think we'll have that movement happening. At the same time, we'll have companies have always been protective of their data. They'll keep being protective of their data. And so you'll end up with this interesting dynamic happening, um, probably even more so than in software. Uh, so I expect we'll have a mixed world where data is, there's a lot of data that's private, but there's a lot of data that's public. And the more data that's public, the more it refines the data that's private, just like open source code. Open source code actually causes companies to be serious about what they make proprietary. They don't just make every software proprietary, they make only the pieces that really matter. And I think we'll see the same in data. Most data will become available, governments will make it available. There's a lot of uh, folks who are incentivized to make it free, and then there'll be a, a shrinking of the data that's proprietary, but we'll always have both. Thanks for the questions. I really appreciate it. Thanks for letting me join you.